to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. I hope you're enjoying this summer season and if there's one thing that summer connotes or brings to mind it's hailstorms uh, we've all experienced them perhaps you've been in a, a particularly intense hailstorm recently and your car has been dented up i remember when i was a kid we had a, a big hailstorm and our our honda got all you know dented up so uh, I bring that up because I wanted to suggest something, and that is that if if you suffer hail damage in this summer season, why not claim that insurance and give a good old donation to OnScript? You can go to onscript.seti forward slash donate, and uh, you don't even have to give the whole insurance claim, maybe just half of it. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. That's just one way you can contribute. You could also give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get this podcast, or perhaps mention it to your insurance claim agent. Kill two birds with one hailstone, so to speak. Okay, uh, thanks so much, and hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to OnScript. Uh, I am your co-host, Dr. Jules Martinez Olivieri. I'm a theologian and a practitioner, and it's been a while. I'm so glad to be back. Today, we will be discussing one of the most pressing issues of our time the refugee crisis. According to the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees, um, there are currently over 26 million refugees worldwide, and the number keeps growing rapidly. And these individuals and communities have been forced to flee their homes due to war, persecution, and other forms of violence, and they are in urgent need of assistance and support. In the United States, you all know that the debate around refugees and asylum seekers is um, increasingly divided, polarized, even aggressive, hostile, uh, with questions about border security and national responsibility to take care of those who are in need in other parts of the world. And this has led to the implementation of policies that has been criticized. They have been criticized for harshness or lack of compassion. We have the situation of refugees in Ukraine, we have the increasing dire humanitarian situation in Sudan. So when we talk about the refugee crisis, this is a big, not only uh, issue in the Americas, but also in the world. And that's the reason why today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Dr. Glenn D. Glenn Butler Jr. about his new book release, um, Jesus the Refugee, Ancient Justice and Modern Solidarity by Fortress Press. Dr. Butner is an esteemed uh, theologian and an author who currently serves as Associate Professor of Theology and Christian Ministry at Sterling College in Kansas, where he also directs the Honors Program. And with several books to his name, including Trinitarian Dogmatics, Exploring the Grammar of the Christian Doctrine of God by Baker, Dr. Butner is well-versed in the field of theology, and he brings a unique integrative perspective to the discussion of the refugee crisis. Glenn, thank you for joining us to get today. I'm eager to to enter to this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor to be here with you. Glenn, I, I think that we actually met probably, I don't know if you remember this, uh, you might not. I think it was back in 2015 or 2016, it was a ETS AAR conference and you were delivering a paper um, the issues of the eternal subordination of the sun. I think you were either about to graduate from Marquette or you already did. It was something I was sitting, wow. I was sitting in your session. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't remember that. I remember the paper, but it was ages ago and I've been familiar with your work for a while and we've interacted online, but yeah, that's going back old school there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad that the world turns around and it is a small world. And um, because it's a small world, when we're talking about the refugee crisis, uh, it is something that touches everyone. So as I, as I look at your book, I see the importance. I see that is a vital issue of life and death. What led you to write this book? I mean, you're a dogmatic theologian, at least known for dogmatics. Usually we don't see necessarily the, uh, the usual transition towards more interdisciplinary dialogues. What led you to write this book? What, what, kind of, what kinds of experiences shape yeah. you in this way? That's a great question. 
from the earliest days of my faith, I've been wrestling with questions of justice, questions of how politics and economics connect with what I believe as a Christian. About the time that I converted, I was working in a warehouse. I was the only native-born American working there. So I had a lot of encounters with immigrants and heard some of their experiences. And I was just a kid. I didn't even know what questions to ask. So there's tons that I didn't know. And that's when I converted is, is late in high school. So right from the start, I'm wondering about you know, why people I'd met were going through these circumstances and what did that have to do with my newfound faith in Jesus. And really moving to me about this time is I went on my first short-term mission trip and you know, now I can look back and there are all sorts of things that weren't great about that, but like short-term trips often do, they did open my eyes to some new things. But really, I came to realize it kept my eyes closed in a lot of ways, too. We were in Costa Rica and we spent a lot of time there in La Carpio, which had a lot of Nicaraguan refugees living there. And I had been working with another group of high schoolers. We're trying to just do sort of basic construction projects and things like that. Um, I've got one story about the trip in the start of my book. I won't tell that one now. I'm going to tell a different one. It's actually from when I get home. Um, we were just struck with how great the people we met were, but what a terrible economic situation many of them found themselves in. And naively and frankly, arrogantly, a couple of high school friends and I wanted to follow up and help. You know, so we write a letter, you know, what can we do to help you get out of this situation that you're in thinking that, oh, you know, they've just been waiting for a couple of, you know, white American high schoolers to write them this letter and then everything would get better, uh, which is ridiculous. Yeah. I don't think we ever even heard anything back from the letter, but I had no idea the factors that had caused the poverty. For example, there were a lot of laws in effect in Costa Rica that would put a a percentage cap on how many immigrants you could have work in uh, in companies there. Um, there were restrictions where a lot of the people who had fled war in Nicaragua weren't recognized as refugees. They weren't recognized as legally there, so they weren't allowed to work. Um, if you can't get a job, you can't work, then of course you're going to be in a tough economic situation. And that's not something that a letter from a couple of high schoolers is ever going to change. So I'm seeing the problems and it took me you know, a decade and a half later, I'd already had a wow. undergraduate degree in economics. I almost did political science as a major. I dropped it. I'm at this point working on my dissertation in theology and economics. I was kind of interdisciplinary first and then went dogmatics because that would, it, it would get me a job and I also love it. But, <laughs> um, so at some point I realized I don't even know the basic legal parameters of how the refugee system works, of how the immigration system works. Mm -hmm. And so even what I'm doing now as a doctoral student, um, and I was working with refugees at the time doing some, some tutoring for uh, school age students that had come from various countries through the refugee system. The little things that I'm doing now are equally naive to how I was in high school because I don't understand the system in which this is occurring. So I started looking at the system and realized there's a lot of messed up stuff that I just had never taken the time and bothered to look at before. Um, and so I'm hoping this book will cause other people to take the time and look at it. Um, and if nothing else, it's been a, a great process for me to understand and learn a whole lot more about just how naive and arrogant I had been. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can echo those kind of, uh, kinds of experiences not only in the context of the Caribbean going to, from Puerto Rico to other places. So, uh, but I'm, but I'm so glad that in your own theological growth, you're making these profound connection to concrete historical situations and how theology can bring to bear alternatives of thinking and praxis. Um, your book, Jesus the Refugee, Ancient Injustice and Modern Solidarity, has a provocative title. W what's the, the main argument of your book? And then we're going to delve into the, the parts. What's the, the main claim? Sure. I see a lot of people use the title Jesus the Refugee basically to score points and social media style political debates. Jesus was a refugee, so we ought to care for refugees. Or, well, no, he didn't leave the Roman Empire. He can't be a refugee. Stop politicizing your faith. I've seen that in church contexts. I've seen that online. I've you know, occasionally read that in different books. But the thesis of my book is that's way too simplistic of an analysis of the question of Jesus receiving the Christological title of refugee. I think it's much more important and more interesting to ask if Jesus and his family were fleeing today, what would likely happen to them under our international refugee regime. And in the book, I argue that more than likely they wouldn't receive help. 
And that's an indictment against the current international regime. But it's also an indictment against simplistic theological explanations that would just say, oh, he is a refugee, let's help, without understanding the context of what help would look like, you know, like I had for so long. So that's that's the basic premise of the book. As I was reading, um, I, I saw how important the story of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph became as, as a framework to understanding by analogy of what's what should we pay attention, Matthew chapter two, and how that challenges our understanding of faith and responsibility towards refugees. Can you tell us a little bit more how that story frames your discussion? Yeah, so I I imagine what if that story was happening for those historical reasons, but right now in our political and economic context. So the nice thing about Matthew 2 is, you know, it involves some major figures in history. It involves Herod. We know a lot about Herod from lots of historical sources. You know, we can't say that about the woman at the well. You know, we can't say that about you know, many of the disciples. We don't have much information about them outside the context of the New Testament canon. But we know a lot in terms of the historical context of what's happening in Matthew 2. So that lets me do a little bit of historical work to say what would have happened to the Holy Family in this historical context. What do we know about Herod? What do we know about the political context that they were in? And then I can apply that historical data to today's political system and say, given these historical reasons for the Holy Family's flight, would they be recognized in our contemporary system? And so I keep trying to turn back and frame as many chapters as I can in the context of Matthew 2 to sort of illustrate and be a pedagogical tool for us to understand the contemporary system. Hmm. Now, I find that that connection very helpful. Um, you know, as Christians in our churches, we are always paying attention to what Jesus did, his choices, etc. But we do not often pay too much attention to the beginning of his life and what was going on, except for Christmas story, except when we want to make echo of the birth narratives or the, the, the Magi, etc. But you're paying strong attention to the sociopolitical conditions of his humanity and what was happening in that moment. So considering that political climate in the first century Judea, could you help us understand why that can be used as a mode of uh, theological thinking, biblical thinking, when we think about migration patterns and refugees as displaced people. Yes. So the historical context comes to play in several ways. Um, for one, people move for for reasons. They don't just arbitrarily pick up and move. Um, migration theory likes to talk about push factors and pull factors. So there are um, reasons why the Holy Family would want to leave their hometown in Judea. And there are reasons why they would wind up going to Egypt. And of course, in the story, one of those big reasons is an angel. And yet at the same time, God in his grace has sent Jesus, Mary, and Joseph to a context where migration would have naturally happened anyway, because you have a large Jewish population there in Alexandria and other places in Egypt. And migration usually involves leaving one place and going to another place where you have connections, people that speak your language, have your culture, maybe even you have some family connections there. So that historical context shows that the migration pattern the Holy Family took shares a lot of characteristics with today's migration patterns. But we can also know the reasons, you know, push factors for why the Holy Family had to leave and the contemporary international uh, refugee regime based on the 1951 Refugee Convention defines a refugee as somebody fleeing for a well-founded fear of persecution based on certain categories such as religious belief or political opinion. Um, there are others. And we know enough about the history to say, well, what would the reasons for the Holy Family running away fit those legal criteria? At least hypothetically, we can't know for sure how a court case would play out today, but that historical context gives us the basis for sort of having a mock trial of the Holy Family, as well as a basis for understanding how migration works even today. Hmm. Yes, yes. And <clears throat> when we consider modern refugee camps, uh, whether it is... Um in the context of the U.S. or in other parts of the world, uh, you, you you mentioned in your book that the, the very design of the facilities can contribute to the very struggles that the refugees are trying to escape. What are some design features that you have found that are that actually are not helpful? Yes, there's there's a lot of them. 
And not every refugee winds up in a camp, but many of them do. And often, for one, camps don't regularly have access to jobs. If you're in a camp, you're often、hmm. legally allowed to be in the camp, but not legally allowed to work. You often don't have great access to educational opportunities,、um, even to sort of cultural celebrations.、Um, and so that, in and of itself, can be very isolating. I read a number of firsthand accounts of refugees, and I, I spoke with、um, some refugees and immigrants in my time researching this book and afterward. And you know, they've these accounts share experiences of just feeling like you're waiting. And the worst part is the wait on average is something like 14 years being in a refugee camp. Wow. Beyond that, there are major issues of safety,、uh, major issues of provision of basic necessities. So I mentioned one camp.、Uh, I think it's the Dunkirk camp in France that only has. Uh, two places for running water with thousands of refugees. So it's just basic sanitation is fundamentally a challenge there.、Um, I read some accounts of refugee camps in Eastern Africa that they don't have good lighting, and a lot of times the water has to be carried、um, from wells and things like that. And so there were a lot of safety issues towards women that would be assaulted. Um, because they're in the dark, walking several miles, trying to bring water back home, and they're easy targets. Because you know, citizens who are acting in such atrocious ways recognize that they're not going to be the priority in terms of investigations for the local authorities.、Um, many locals、mm. would probably rather they move on. So they're easy victims to prey on. So those are two of the sorts of examples. There are a lot of structural features in the camp itself. That can be a challenge. Even though I recognize that there are organizations doing good work, and and some people do get resettled from camps, even if most just sit there for year after year and even decades sometimes.、Hmm. The militarization of border control is one of those big issues that refugees encounter,、uh, whether they made it to a border or they are in in a camp outside the border, etc. And、uh, I, I wonder how the militarization of For border control, sends the ideological message that these people are dangerous. It seems that they get mixed with all kinds of misconceptions and disinformation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How the militarization of borders affect the experiences of asylum seekers and all these misconceptions and construals of the other as the dangerous right. one? Right. That's an excellent question and connecting. Two really important ideas together. There's certainly been an increased militarization of the border.、Um, you can look at everything from the technology used,、um, which is often adopted from, you know, the technology we develop for warfare, to the actual individuals employed at the U.S. border, for example, where a very high percentage have actually served previously in the armed forces, to a you know the methods and、um, means that are used of border control. Um, increasing incidents of violence,、uh, human rights violations and abuses in various countries around the European and North American contexts.、Uh, Australia, I didn't even touch on that in the book. There are a lot of really terrible、mm-hmm. accounts coming out of the methods used in Australia and New Zealand to deter immigrants trying to come across the ocean. I think the fact of militarization itself leads people consciously or subconsciously to say, "Why do we need such?" Forceful means of deterring people from entering our country. Presumably, we might be prone to think if these violent means are used, it must be because there's a great threat that these incoming individuals pose to us. And sure, it's certainly the case that you know drugs are cross, you know, brought across borders, and you know maybe there's、uh, criminals or you know violence that's possible. But statistically, it's just not true that that's the normal normal reality for an individual trying to cross the border. And what makes it even more ridiculous is the international system. Plan A is cross a border, and then you can claim to be a refugee. But the domestic plan A for most countries is don't cross my border until we've given you permission to do so. But you can't have permission to cross as a refugee until you've already gotten here. But the problem is that means for a refugee who's just you know, a human being needing help because they're facing persecution in their home because they're fleeing war, even if that's not. Uh, convention definition refugee. There's still somebody fleeing and seeking help.、Um, they have to break a law, a very trivial one, by the way. We're not talking a felony or anything here. It's actually handled in civil court most of the time. But they have to break a law, a domestic level, to enter.
which is the plan at the international level. And so immediately they're framed as lawbreakers and criminals. And if they're lawbreakers and criminals, of course they can't yeah. be moral, right? Because moral people never break laws or criminals. And next thing you know, you've turned a refugee from human being coming from a tough context into a criminal, someone who's immoral, somebody who's dangerous that we have to use force to repel them. And that's a completely wrong way of framing the situation when it comes to refugees. Yeah, I can see that in all kinds of conversations happening from, you know, the coffee shop to uh, even church settings uh, to uh, the news and the media. Uh, we use these categories and uh, the categories of the criminal, the lawbreaker, the illegal, they, they tend to be used ideologically. That, that is, they tend to correspond to specific uh, party line discourses. And I... I struggle to to find ways in which we can um, not only help our students in the context of higher education uh, to escape ideological logics uh, with some kind of intellectual independence, <laughs> but also with prophetic independence. What, what are some of, su of successful accounts in your experience of people moving from ideological misconceptions and discourses to a more balanced, real, humane uh, ways of approaching this? That's a wonderful question. And I wish I had hundreds of stories to share with you, but it seems to me that often once we're trapped in that ideological partisanship, that it's not easy to escape. In my experience, direct contact with somebody who's immigrated is a, a great way to begin to see that the stereotypes just don't fit the reality. As long as the other is simply a symbol or a cipher for a political goal. You know, quote, securing our border in order to ensure growth of our GDP per capita, um, which most of the profits going toward certain sectors of our country and not the average person. But as long as, you know, an immigrant is viewed as a threat to that American dream of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, and it's not somebody that you sat down and had a meal with, then it's going to be very difficult for you to transition from you know, viewing them as a threat to viewing them as a human being, someone that we can learn from and receive from, just as we may have opportunities to help and stand in solidarity with them. So accounts that I've heard are often biographical in nature. There's one that I've assigned with students, um, Love Undocumented. It's actually about uh, an American devout Christian, Sarah Kazada. She's uh, going through the experience of falling in love with someone that she finds out is undocumented and kind of how that personal relationship requires her to change all of her assumptions about how immigration works. Um, so stories like that, I think, are often the most helpful. I don't have as compelling of a personal story there, um, but I'm hoping that in Jesus the Refugee, I can connect that question to someone that Christians do have a personal connection with in Jesus Christ, but they often wouldn't imagine him in the context of someone trying to come across a border without permission. Um, but that would be what Mary and Joseph would have to do if they were trying to be refugees. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that personal connection might function similarly. That would mm. be the example I immediately think of. Thank you. I, yeah, that's illuminating. Um, you know, the historical context of discrimination, you, you discuss it in your book and um, particularly in the first century uh, in, in the process of doing the connection prejudice against Jews in Egypt uh, during the times of Jesus. Um, and uh, you, you find parallels faced by modern refugees in potential host countries. What can be learned from those comparisons? So I was surprised in my research of the extent to which anti-Semitism had already taken root in Egypt in the first century. And mm. thinking about the patterns, you asked some great questions you sent me in advance. So I was able to wrestle with some things that I hadn't necessarily exhaustively addressed in the book or even sufficiently sometimes addressed in the book. But I do see some basic patterns there, some similarities. One thing that really struck me in my research is first century Egypt. Um, and even a little bit before then, you'd already had re-narrations of the biblical account of the Exodus. But on these re-narrations, mm -hmm. it wasn't that the Egyptians had enslaved the people of Israel who then were liberated by God through plagues it was that the Israelites were a health and safety threat. They were causing these plagues because they themselves were plague bearers. They were immoral. They were dangerous. And so Pharaoh actually kicked them out for the safety of the people of Egypt. 
And with these re-narrations, the first century people of Israel um, are now viewed as continuing threats. So you hear ridiculous and radical accusations that they will kidnap people and end up cannibalizing them or that they would do ritual murder or all sorts of atrocities like this that there's really no mm, historical wow. basis for. I see things like this all the time. You have a narrative, you know, like the narrative of the Exodus, and you know, we don't need to get into all of those historiographic debates, but you, you've got something rooted in history in some way, and then, um, and I'd say very much rooted in history, but, and then you have tiny pieces of that history distorted with falsehood slipped in, and you completely change the meaning of what the story is in a manner that changes our fundamental perceptions about a group of people. And so, so often, you know, I can look back on middle school and high school and what I was learning from history about American relations with Mexico or with Haiti or, you know, any other number of countries that send many immigrants here. And I'm only getting part of the story mixed with spin that isn't very accurate, that helps perpetuate false understandings of who immigrants today are. And so it wasn't until I researched this book that I even knew very much about the extent of colonial aspirations of the United States toward Haiti. I knew about it in other places, but a lot of that's in the background of the migratory patterns we see today as President Trump and now President Biden are working to reduce and almost even eliminate Haitian refugees and asylees trying to come to this country. Um, that's because the historical narratives have been yeah. distorted, just like they were against the people of Israel in the first century in Egypt. The way in which uh, policy, international policy, applied to issues of uh, refugee resettlement is done, I think there is an element of, of desiring that all political parties will be in a position to value humanity to the level that they should. We can clearly say, for example, people think that if you challenge the harshness of certain policies in the United States, then that means that you are immediately aligning yourself with one political party. Uh, the thing is that both political parties in the United States have a very uh, negative record when it comes to refugee resettlement. I remember back in the day when Obama was president, from the perspective of the Latino community, some people call him the deportator in chief. Uh, and it was a way of highlighting that uh, despite public discourse, the way in which policies are implemented are often not in consonance with what people think is happening. So due process, um, laws that are fair and just, it makes me also, also think that one part of this discussion is that we're often ignorant, you mentioned this, of the colonial history and in the ways in which nations are responsible for the very mobilization of masses in other places, in other latitudes, to their uh, borders. In the case of the United States, uh, very responsible for m lots of instability in certain Latin American countries, or uh, the way in which uh, international uh, economic treaties are done. I remember when uh, coffee in the 90s was going up as a world consumption, you know, uh, material of uh, food. Transnational companies in the United States, Canada, and Europe develop a way of monopolizing the agriculture in Latin America and in Asia in such a way that the cost of coffee in those places um, basically went down to the ground while they maximize the profits. And um, what you had what was a lot of people then opting for one of the corridors of migration that you mentioned, their corridors around the world, to other wealthier countries in order to find some kind of economic stability. But we don't often think of those terms. Now I'm thinking, uh, thinking out loud, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's really well said. Um... And again, history and the history of colonialism is just essential. One of my favorite books on immigration ethics is Tisha Regender's Migrants and Citizens. And she really breaks down some of the migration theory in a way that's easy to manage, but also connects it with some really, really interesting work in Christian ethics. But 
one of the main points that she makes in her summary is that when it comes to pull factors where people decide to go, they often go where there are other people like them, as I've already mentioned. But why are there other people like them somewhere? Often it's because those connections were already established through colonialism or they were already established through business. You know, as you're destabilizing a certain part of the population in Latin America, you're also bringing a certain part of the population to the United States so that they can play a role in this transnational economic um, you know, process. And that transnationalism sets up those migration corridors. And once we turn them on, we like to think, oh, I can just say, okay, stop coming now and turn them off. But that's not really how it works. First of all, immigration law is so complicated. I spent you know, a couple of years trying to prep for writing this book and reading on this. You know, I've got a PhD, not in law at all, but um, I can at least read a lot and understand it. And I had a really hard time understanding the complexity of these laws. Some of the narratives that I've read are how the same recruiters that used to bring people under legal work programs from places like Mexico continued as recruiters under illegal work programs once the laws had changed. The workers had no idea anything was different. They're still just trying to come across the border because that's just how they've always gotten their work. And that's what they have to do because companies have come in and by design to get an increased market share have eliminated many of the local employment opportunities. But then the average citizen doesn't know that social context, that political context. They don't know it's the same recruiter saying, yeah, we want you to come up and work in the United States again. They just think, here's somebody that broke a law and came into the country that shouldn't be here. And it's lacking all context. In, in your book, you enter into talking to Christians about the concept of solidarity in light of the image of God and mutual responsibility that we have as a community towards refugees and other vulnerable groups. How important is this concept of solidarity and, and how do you tie it to different forms of solidarity? You mentioned institutional solidarity, for example, etc. So I draw a threefold distinction. So institutional, incarnational, and conflictual solidarity from Kristen Heyer. But then the fundamental idea of solidarity, I'm largely drawing from liberation theologians, in Latin America, um, Sabrino, I like on this a lot. Their basic understanding of solidarity is one that emphasizes mutuality. And so when I stand in solidarity with someone, I am pledging my support. I am pledging my care. I am pledging my attention, my brotherhood. But I'm also pledging that I will receive from them support. I will receive from them the gifts that they have by virtue of having the image of God. And so that's at a very basic level of values, me trying to shift away from the mindset that I shared from my story at the beginning of this podcast. I, as an arrogant high schooler, couldn't really imagine what I might receive from the people I was hoping to help in the Carpio. And again, that's pure arrogance. I'd already received from them. I knew that they cooked phenomenal food. I knew they were extremely friendly and gracious. They were uh, seemingly very devout and worship, but that's really the only thing I had in mind in my prejudice. Um, solidarity pushes against that because for me to help someone, I have to recognize that I am standing with someone who's equal, who has many things to offer me as well. And within that framing of it value-wise, incarnational solidarity is just bodily presence, having those relationships then institutional solidarity, I can be present with someone. And I was for many years as I began to realize my naivety and my arrogance. I continued working with refugees, but I didn't understand the legal system still. And there's only so much you can do without changes to legal processes. And so institutional solidarity says, where do we need to change the church? Where do we need to change the state? Where do we need to change the national government? What do we need to change at an international level? What are NGOs doing incorrectly? And then conflictual solidarity, you're going to find things that people aren't going to like that need to be changed. And there comes a time for calm and rational deliberation. And there comes a time when you need to be a bit more conflict oriented. You need to be willing to you know, lose some respect from certain people based on what you think and what you believe, uh, to lose you know, financial benefits in certain ways. And all three of those dimensions, I think, are an important aspect of what solidarity with the refugee should actually look like today. You, you relate also solidarity to the principle of restitution, and you work through your way through the Old Testament. How do you apply the principle 
of restitution to the treatment of refugees. I'm kind of doing some some triage there, a little bit of ethical realism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you, yes. you named 26 million refugees if we include non-convention refugees who don't fit that international definition. So they're fleeing natural disaster or war. You know, you include internally displaced persons that are not outside of countries' borders. Some counts are as high as 80 million. That's a lot. And realistically, you know, we're not just going to change next year and suddenly fix that situation. So hearing those numbers, people might be overwhelmed and say, I don't even know where to start. And so the idea of restitution is my way of trying to wrestle with, well, where do we start? How do we make one step toward being better at showing solidarity? And so the principle of restitution is simply, if you have caused harm, you need to make it right. I mean, that's, that's what I teach my six-year-old when he gets in a fight with my eight-year-old. Um, so what I'm trying to teach my two-year-old, she's not there yet. Um, this is pretty basic. It's fundamental, I think, to a lot of Old Testament ethics frankly, a lot of other ethical systems as well. But once we understand the context of migration theory, and we see that, um, you know, it might be through colonialism that certain people groups are needing to relocate, then that gives us immediate examples of people that we could show solidarity to first. Another example would be Afghanistan. I'm really, really disturbed to see how little care is being offered to American allies in Afghanistan people whose lives are directly at risk because of the way that they served with people in our armed forces. And whatever you think about that war, whatever you think about how we withdrew from that war, the fact that their life is at risk partly for their association with us and partly because of our military involvement, I think gives us a much more urgent uh, moral responsibility and duty to provide a means of safety for them, to show that institutional solidarity and many efforts at more long-term resettlement here are failing. Right now, it sounds like another temporary solution is going to be extended to Afghans who are already here. Um, that's just causing them to live in limbo. We need to be able to do more than that. And the principle of restitution would point to that as a, another good example. You not only use um, and pay attention to um, the Holy Family, um, there are other key passages in the gospel that you go to one of them is the parable of the sheep and the goats in matthew 25 and you highlight the importance of how this parable can inform the treatment of strangers such as refugees with care and compassion can you tell us a little bit about more about that yeah so i'm an evangelical who has never been educated by evangelicals um <laughs> but that means a lot of what I'm, I'm writing in is sort of wrestling with my evangelical identity and, you know, my evangelical past, the church that I converted in and was baptized in. So part of that is a, a running dialogue with several evangelical scholars who interpret the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, and it isn't just evangelicals that read it this way, but for me, that's who I'm focusing on. Um, but they interpret this passage as being about how we treat disciples. So... The language of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, is understood to be language about brothers and sisters in Christ, those who believe, those who are disciples. And so I try and make a, a detailed argument that no, I think the better understanding of this is actually referring to those who are marginalized, those who are in a very literal way are poor, needing clothes, those who are, you know, needing help because they've immigrated, they're a stranger and they need to be welcomed. Um, and so I spend a lot of time looking at those arguments back and forth. But at the end of the day, even if I'm wrong on what Matthew 25 means, I argue that the moral sense of scripture would still justify it being extended to the marginalized because of what we see across the canon. And so we can see in the Proverbs that, you know, the one who does something for the man who's poor is also acting toward God. Um, we can see uh, commandments in the law, um, in the Pentateuch, that mm -hmm. you will be blessed for welcoming the stranger, that you can be cursed for not treating them justly. And so the same basic principles, whatever we do mm -hmm. to the migrant, we're doing to God. Whatever we do to the person with economic need as they've had to flee their country, we're doing to God. Whenever we are unjust, then we face condemnation in the final judgment. We face critique from our Lord and Savior, much the way that the goats do. I think that principle is really inviolable in scripture. And that is a means of me trying to persuade Christians to see how fundamental this is to our identity in Christ, how fundamental it is. Um, beyond that, 
the very idea of what you've done to the least of these you've done to me, I'm hoping it's, it's a very non-subtle way for me to say, look, everything I've been saying about Jesus is really also about the Jesuses of today, the least of these who are trying to get across the border yeah. right now, and they're not going to be able to because of militarization. They're waiting for their 15th year in a refugee camp, and they're still sitting there. And we haven't hit the refugee quota um, the last couple of years under the Biden administration. He's raised the quota from where it was under the Trump administration, but he hasn't put the infrastructure in place. And so we could be welcoming tens of thousands exactly. more. And he's even privatized it so that individuals can directly sponsor refugees. And we're not going to hit the quota again this year is what I anticipate. And when we don't, we're leaving Jesus sitting somewhere without the ability to have the basic dignity of the opportunity to work, the opportunity to live somewhere safely. And we're doing that to Jesus just as we're doing it to the unnamed refugees we haven't met. They're not a threat. They are Christ present to us in a certain way today. And this is where your, your concept of incarnational solidarity that you mentioned comes into play in a very personal way amongst evangelical circles and in other wider circles, people talk about uh, being incarnational. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it sounds nice for many. Um, it's part of the lingua franca in some circles, but but you're putting some uh, material content to that. So how would you explain incarnational solidarity to a group of uh, church folk, lay people um, that want to move in mission, that want to move uh, in care and compassion? Uh, and they're wondering, okay, we are here in the local church. There are levels of the discussion. How can we show it? How can we show this incarnational solidarity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think if we look at Christ's incarnation, there's there's a lot that we can learn from there. And when we talk about being incarnational, of course, obviously that's what we're referencing. But I think so often we don't even realize what we're saying. It's just sort of Christian slang that sounds good. It plays well. It gets people to come to our event, you know, our ministry event. But the incarnation is enduring. It's ongoing. Christ has bodily ascended. This isn't just you know a short-term mission trip. He came here for a couple of weeks, worked out salvation, left his humanity behind, and went back to the Father. This is you know, two millennia now of the eternal son of God taking on human nature. It's a long standing real relationship and it got pretty ugly, right? I mean, we killed him and there has to be real repentance, recognizing that, you know, our sins play a role in that, that I personally probably wouldn't have accepted Christ had I seen him in the first century. Um, there are times in my life when I would have scoffed at him, laughed at him, mocked him, ridiculed him. I would have cheered crucify him. And incarnational ministry has to be in it for the long game. You know, it, it can't just be, oh, I'm going to go do one event with this immigrant community in my city. And then I've done incarnational solidarity. And it can't just be, oh, I, I'm going to do it as long as it feels good. And when things get tough or when I realize I've messed up and I have to repent, I'm just going to move on to the next thing. It's going to take a lot of humility to recognize that, that we're wrong. And I guess the last thing I would think of in terms of incarnational solidarity Christ grew in wisdom. Christ in his humanity learned obedience, as Hebrews said. Um, he actually took something human that isn't proper to God. God doesn't grow in wisdom. God, I don't believe, obeys. Um, and he made that proper to himself. He actually received something from the people that he came to be incarnate with. And that raises all kinds of metaphysical questions, but this is not the dogmatics episode. This is looking more at social ethics. And so the social ethics implications of that I think are that if we're going to say we're going to do incarnate incarnational solidarity, that a lot of attention has to be paid to receiving. Where do I need to change to be one with the people that I'm wanting to be one with? Where do I need to learn from them? Where do I need to have new experiences and new ideas and actually let them change who I am rather than coming in sort of as the hero of the story, self-proclaimed. And so that would be a basic framework. What that looks like, because it's incarnational, is going to be different in each and every church and each and every city. But I know that there are refugee resettlement organizations that would happily work most churches through that opportunity. Um, and with the new opportunities for individuals and groups to sponsor refugee resettlement, I know a lot that are looking for partnerships with churches. So I haven't given any practical details here, but if any clergy are hearing that or any church members, uh, just Google refugee resettlement organization and you've got opportunities right there. And they'll guide you through trainings that I waited way too long to take that'll help prepare you for some of those cultural difficulties and working with somebody who's had different experiences than you. Hmm, thank you. That's that's very helpful. And 
in, in moving from incarnational solidarity, uh, what are some examples of institutional solidarity? The language of incarnational solidarity for a lot of people will be closer to their own individuality, their own personal practice, whereas institutional solidarity requires a community. Yes, as an individual, I can look for those spaces, but it almost requires a, a communal response. What are some of the examples of communal response towards institutional solidarity? Yeah, that's a great question. Institutionally, a lot of it has to be politics. And I wish it could skip politics. I'm not a big fan of our American political landscape. One of the things that really blew my mind as I've been doing research the last few years is uncovering Operation Streamline. And it's been in effect for a decade and a half now, I believe. It's been through several different presidential administrations, but the basics of the program are mass trials of, in some instances, 70 individuals over an hour or two period of individuals that have crossed the border and been apprehended without documentation. Now, some of them could be refugees and asylees. Some of them could fit other categories of legal protection, special juvenile immigration status. Um, some of them might not fit our legal categories. And then we can ask, are our legal categories sufficient? But hardly anybody is going to have time to prove their case in two hours with 60 some other people on trial with them where they spoke to a lawyer for 15 minutes before the case. And I don't see how that can be even a play at justice. In my mind, that's just a means of efficiently clearing out holding cells so that we can fill them with new people that we've apprehended at the border without really offering any form of real trial or any, any real effort to understand their circumstances and where they're coming from. And that's not something that I personally can change. That's not something one individual church can change. That's something that it's going to take broad political efforts to change. And I did reach out to a few organizations that do lobbying and said, hey, do you have anything going on this issue? I'd love to piggyback on it because I don't think, you know, I'm going to mobilize enough people with my book to really get this changed. And I actually couldn't find anybody doing anything about it. Others have written on it. Um, Miguel de la Torre has done a, a lot of good work exposing it in the U.S. immigration crisis. But it's going to take mobilization of large numbers of people to change something like Operation Streamline. And mobilization like that is usually you know, takes the form of uh, of local communities, uh, the local church, the local non for profit uh, that cares for the common good, and then f is 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 from the down up. Uh, usually, at least in the the logics of the two party system within the United States, you find either usually a discourse that is saying, "Oh, we're doing all these things to transform and be more humane." but in de facto, they're not doing it, or we just want to be humane, but only for our people. And then maybe we can consider a limited amount of people from other places. And uh, that's, uh, those are false options, uh, and yet they dominate the discourse. So many Christians, I think, um, they, they, they feel uh, hesitant to delve deeper into the issues of the refugee policy making because they think that there will betray some kind of deeply held value that their political party is telling them that they should uphold. And I am impressed about how many leaders that I've met uh, and students and etc. cetera, uh, their loyalty to ideology is stronger than the loyalty to the prophetic dimension of confrontation that we find in the Christian tradition and scripture, primarily in the prophetic tradition. And it be all, it almost becomes an idol. Now I realize I'm just stating things, but stating them well, <laughs> I, I, I wonder what will be uh, a one, two, three step in your mind to engage in conversations that mobilize people of people that identify themselves as Christians, that value scripture, and that say, well, Jesus is my savior, I love Jesus, etc." cetera. What are some clues to a good communication in this uh, area? I like to start with eschatology, thinking about the virtue of hope and the you know golden mean there between 
um, despair and presumption. Sometimes I see despair, you know, our world is so messed up, we can't do anything to make it better. And I've even felt that at times I just waste a little bit of despair. I think about Operation Streamline, like I don't see what I can even do to change this and I hate it. Um, but more often, I think we have presumption. I have to fix this now fully on my own ability. And then we find an idol that supposedly is going to help us get that done. And often those idols are our political parties. And they get a little bit done. I think politics can have some value. But they're never going to get it all done. And often they get a lot less done than they could. And one yeah. thing that enables them to do that is once we've said, we need to fix all this, they're going to fix it for me. Then we start being willing to do all sorts of things in defense of the higher good that we will get from the people who are going to fix it for us. And so a good starting point, you know, I like to challenge people with is, can you critique your own political allies? Can you critique your own party? Can you critique your own representative? I try. So important. I, I don't yes. know how fair I am. I'm sure I still have bias, but I try to critique every presidential administration since Jimmy Carter in the book. I think they all fall short of the kingdom yeah. standard. Mm -hmm. And they all need to do better. Would I do better in office? I'd like to think so, but who knows if I actually got there, how many compromises I'd have to make, but they all fell short. And once you can start to say that, then it opens up the possibility of then learning about the system and making specific critiques. Well, not only should they do better because we can't in presumption say they're going to fix it all, but they should do better with Operation Streamline. And then once we've named that, we can start looking toward that community organizing you talked about at a local level, what steps can we take toward combating Operation Streamline? And uh, that would be, in theory, a three-step process. I haven't done it toward Operation Streamline, but I've, I've tried it in some other areas. And I, I think that's an example then of what would you call conflictual solidarity to hold accountable to higher standards, the political traditions that we adhere to hopefully with an extra political framework, which might be deeply theologically informed, theologically informed for Christians, at least. Let me step back a little bit. You are a dogmatic theologian, and uh, I don't know if you have gotten this criticism. Well, just stick to your lane, bro. You know, do, do your doctrine thing. <laughs> um, let the politicians and maybe the political theologians, maybe, de you know, deal with this. Let everybody make their own mind. Just stick to doctrine. How do you answer that? I haven't gotten much of that yet, but probably because not a lot of people are reading the book. So, um, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> we'll but... see. Yeah, your, your podcast <laughs> is going to elevate me to the New York Times sellers list, right? And then, then we'll see what people say. Um <laughs> no, I think I think that's just a completely false dichotomy. I readily will mm -hmm. admit that I lack the theoretical apparatus of some political theologians in addressing many of the questions that I'm trying to address in the book. Completely granted, no contest there. But as soon as we have a bifurcation between dogmatics and ethics, we've already sold the whole thing anyway. Because then we pose the question, is the church... If these are fundamentally different things, is the church primarily going to be about dogmatics or is it primarily going to be about ethics? And frankly, I think many churches are going to choose dogmatics. And if it's posed as a choice, then they're just not going to address ethics at all. And we're left in that reframing of all of theological history as sort of a recapitulation of you know, the conservative imagination of liberalism and fundamentalism in the early 1900s. Everything is a battle for orthodoxy and the threat of people that are trying to reduce theology to ethics. And so we're scared of ethics in the church because we want to preserve good theology. And I do theology that some of the people listening to me now that maybe like what I'm saying about refugees, they may not like what I'm doing in theology, and that's fine. And I do ethics that some of the people that like my theology are just scratching their heads saying, why are you doing this? But I think it's important that they be held together to say, look, I can affirm the virgin birth, the divinity of Christ, the reality of the resurrection, you know, whatever, mm. and say, while I affirm that, that just increases my desire to say, Jesus is Lord. And he says, mm. I identify with the migrant. Whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. 
And so we're doing these things to my Lord, who is God, who literally rose from the dead, who has atoned for my sins. And we're doing it to the people that he said, that's me. And so that should make me care about this more and not less. Even while I grant, you'll find more sophisticated theoretical analysis in some other works. Um, if, honestly, if that's what you're looking for, my book is not the starting point. I'm writing more for the person that says, I don't really understand this system, but I feel mm. compelled that I should do something. And maybe even, Lord willing, some people that say, I don't want to do anything. And by the time they're done with my book, they do. So that's where I see myself fitting in the body of Christ. And you know, my role is not everybody's role. And don't assign me in a political theology doctoral course. It'll probably be disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, I, I, I love the way that you uh, connect the importance of doing dogmatic work, doctrinal work, with the way in which doctrine plays out in the world. Because uh, if theology has to do with God and all things related to God, then this is one of the most uh, vital things that we can relate to God, the dignity of humanity. Towards the end of your book, you say, you're talking about solidarity with Jesus, the refugee. I quote, a complete Christian response to the international refugee crisis would extend into a myriad of disciplines and practices from missiology to social ethics, from the practical institutional design of faith-based non-for-profits tasked with aiding in the resettlement of refugees to complex policy packages designed by Christian think tanks and lobbyists intended for promotion in a wide range of political contexts. You say this exploration of Jesus, the refugee, has a, for, a far more modest goal, one that is only part of a full Christian theology, an ethic of migration. I like this. I like this. Um, you are pinpointing the fact that you, your contribution here is to mark the urgency for Christians of attending missionally, practically, politically, sociologically, to the crisis of refugees that are in our door. And you took care of theological matters, you took care of, of wide political and policy and historical situations in order to, to make us this profound, vital invitation. Glenn, if you were to kind of uh, recapture your intent in the book, what, what, what else would you like us to, to have in mind and consider? I've covered a lot at this point. To reiterate, we have to get particular, you know, move yes. beyond the abstraction of Jesus was a refugee, so at a values level, I should care for refugees. To consider how your values would actually be manifest in a particular concrete historical and legal situation. And my situation is here in the United States. There are other situations around the world. I touch on Europe a little bit, but there are many contexts where Christians are, where something needs to change. And why not start with us? Why not start with the body of Christ? So that's really the, the challenge that I lay down in the book uh, as best as I can. And hopefully people who read it will feel like picking that challenge up and doing something with it. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, friends, um, I've, we've had the pleasure of interviewing and dialoguing with uh, Dr. D. Glenn Butner Jr. about his new book, Jesus the Refugee, Ancient Injustice and Modern Solidarity by Fortress Press. And the challenge of Jesus the Refugee serves to all of us as a call to action, of analysis, even to repentance, to recognize how the modern refugee condition and situation uh, deserves our full compassion, deserves our attention with dignity and justice. Thank you so much, Glenn, for taking the time to be with us. And remember, you, you need to get this book. It's great for group discussions. And uh, I hear that Fortress Press is doing some other initiatives in the summer uh, with it. Right, Glenn? Yeah, so we're still hammering down details. I hope that happened by today, but June is International Refugee Month. So I've put together a reading guide for use in churches that includes for each chapter different organizations that you might look at and different data that you can look at. And I'm trying to press them to do sort of a matching situation where I'll give a certain portion of royalties and they'll match it. So 
already a portion of sales go to Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, but I'm hoping a much bigger one will if you buy through Fortress. Um, I'm waiting to hear details on that, but um, that's kind of the hope that we get churches reading through this and you know get funds for it through it. So stay tuned, follow me or Fortress on social media, then you can unfollow me afterward if you're just interested in this. Um, but that's what we're looking at. What's your handle on, on Twitter? It's uh, Glenn Butner, at Glenn Butner, G-L-E-N-N-B-U-T-N-E-R. Usually fairly boring. <laughs> well, uh, follow Dr. Butner and thank you so much again uh, for helping us think through this pressing humanitarian issue through Christian Lens. Thanks for having me on. It's been great. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate. 